how has music helped you to process some of your traumatic experiences? Some people who misunderstand sad music are like, what? like even my mom, she doesn't want to hear anything sad in the car, <laughs> you know? She's like, why would you want to kind of soak in that feeling? Honestly, it's kind of like trauma representation. It's like when I read a book that's super dark or something, there's like a weight lifted because it's just someone that you look, look up to laying all this out that you relate to. Let's start at the beginning. Tell me about where you grew up and what your childhood was like. I was raised in Pasadena, which is like a suburb of LA for people who don't know. My parents are like huge music fans. They like listened to tons of music when I was growing up and I feel like I owe the entirety of my music taste at an early age to them. I have a little brother too, who's like a visual artist. My dad's in construction. My mom has had a string of odd jobs, but then now, is doing stand-up comedy for fun. I usually get roasted pretty hard if I go to see one of her shows. What is she saying in her stand-up? <laughs> it's like, most of it is like, is like too humiliating to even say out loud. But yeah, she definitely roasts me for like, always dating crusty people because of music. I recommend it. I recommend Jamie Bridgers if you want to know some like, really excruciating details about my life. You should see my mom's comedy, like stand-up comedy. My parents were super supportive. They had a very tumultuous relationship, so definitely going through a lot of therapy, but I think I turned out all right. And I went to this awesome free performing arts high school called LOXA that you have to audition for, but then again, it's a public school and it's free, which is, it's incredible to me that it exists. And I had like a year of opera <laughs> and a year of jazz, and then I just went into music technology. I mean, it was such a musical high school that you started an all-female band there. One of my best friends, Haley Dahl, her band called Sloppy Jane. It was kind of more of like a three chords and screaming punk band when I was in it, thank God, because I'm horrible at bass. But then now they're like, you know, anywhere from 10 piece to 20 piece band with like a full string quartet. And we've gone on tour together as adults and it's, yeah, it's like one of my favorite bands. You, you said you were horrible at bass, but I know, you, I know you're good at plucking that guitar though when it's not the bass. How did you get involved in playing instruments and what instruments did you start with? I was forced to take piano lessons. <laughs> I wasn't that interested in it for some reason. I'm not a great math student and that's what it felt like to me. It felt like learning a whole other type of math. So I feel like guitar was my rebellion, which was probably my mom's overarching plan was for me to rebel and start playing guitar instead of piano. But she let me believe that it was a true rebellion and then I quit piano and started taking guitar lessons. Did you know that this was something that you'd be doing for the rest of your life? Yeah, I think I was overconfident before I was any good because of my mom. There's a venue here called The Smell. It's named very appropriately and she would like drop me off I would play a show and then she'd pick me up at like three o'clock in the morning. She was just so supportive. After high school, you know, those crusty bars led you somehow to Berkeley, which is amazing, but you decided not to go. I didn't really want to go to school um, because I'm bad at school, but I was already kind of playing shows and just felt like, why would I go to more music school? But my mom was like, look, totally fair, whatever but like you need to apply to one school, just one. And so I chose Berkeley School of Music because I have, I'm a fan of tons of people who went there. We went to like a little LA orientation and she was basically like, this is rad, but it's also expensive. And yeah, you're like, this would be you learning how to do what you're doing. When do you get to that moment where you finally get what many would call your big break? It's funny, I feel like I've had hundreds of big breaks like every mm. every little thing felt like a big break to me you know like selling a hundred tickets in london felt like my big break and then going on tour where i wasn't really making any money but i got to play with the violent femmes that felt like my big break getting signed to dead oceans again like every minute and then last year it's like grammys and you know somebody i think is cool tweets about me or something. Like everything feels like, you know, a new level to me, which is awesome. At what point did you begin really solidifying your solo journey? I didn't understand the concept of not playing every five seconds. And more than anything, I feel like I just made tons of friends from those shows. It's how I met my drummer, Marshall, who, you know, we write tons of songs together. And Harrison, my guitar player, we just met through 
tons of mutual friends and I feel like they contributed so much to the way that I sound. I didn't really know what I was doing before I met them. So I feel like it was mostly just about getting out there and meeting people. When did uh, Stranger in the Alps come into the picture? My friend Andy Oliphant was kind of like helping me out a lot. He's a music guy and he introduced me to Tony Berg, who's this producer. And I had like convinced myself I didn't need a producer. I was like, I'm just gonna make my record by myself on like a four track tape machine. And then I met Tony and we hung out for like nine hours. We just kind of like nerded out about music. And then we spent two years, he, you know, he worked on it for free. He just was like, I'm sure we'll get paid at some point basically. <laughs> but I was getting like random tours and stuff that I always wanted to go on. And then I'd come back and record for a couple weeks go out, tour for a couple weeks, come back, record for a couple weeks. But I think I really needed that time. Like, I think that I wrote my favorite songs for that record while I was on tour. And now that's like my favorite way to work. What is it about your process that works for you and how'd you kind of find that? Well, I totally found it on accident. I think when I was making my first record, I thought I was totally ready. I thought I had all the songs, but then I think I got a little bit snow blind. Like it was just kind of a soft folk record with cool sounds and stuff. Like there was nothing very exciting about my record. <laughs> I just was like, it needs something else. And I wrote my song Motion Sickness as like this ballad and we recorded it like that. And then Tony was like, this needs drums and it needs to, you know, be like a real song. We can't have this be a fake song. So I think what's nice about it is just being able to listen and then try again. I feel like that's our process for the most part is making something and then scrapping all of it and doing something else. How often do you begin writing your songs as ballads and then filling in the blanks later? Like almost 100% of the time. And I think it's because I write by myself. I also like live in a place where one of my neighbors yelled through my window for me to shut up once. So I write really quietly <laughs> and then I bring it into a studio and that's almost like getting to write it again. So instead of writing 50 songs, I feel like I write 50 versions of the same song <laughs> until it's the one I want. Where do you draw inspiration from? I just kind of focus on lyrics first. That's for mostly personal experience. But then production wise, uh, I will listen to kind of as much as possible. And then I'll make like a playlist of little ideas and stuff. When you get into songs that are as deeply personal as, as motion sickness, are you ever worried or concerned with being that honest, being that transparent? Is that a difficult process or is it more of a cathartic process? It is cathartic and I think the way that I comfort myself through writing it is just like, you don't have to show this to anybody. But then by the time I record, I'm usually already over it or I'm excited to put it into the world. But that's kind of how I trick my brain into doing it. And I have yet to edit myself for the public. I feel like if I didn't write about personal stuff, I would be robbing myself of the experience of talking to fans with mirrored experiences. It's so fun to play a show or joke about something dark and then have somebody come up to you and you're laughing about trauma, basically. You know, you're laughing about something or a shared experience and you're like, man, I'm so glad I said that because otherwise I wouldn't have had that conversation. Punisher comes out June 18th, 2020. What made you decide on that name for the album? It's a name for oh, kind of overzealous fans. And I, I don't think of a Punisher as somebody who just likes your music and comes up and tells you, because believe it or not, that's great. Everybody wants to hear that somebody likes the thing that you make. I feel like a Punisher specifically is, say you're at a party and someone just corners you and wants to talk about like the darkest possible thing on the news that they saw. They don't realize how in hell you are and that you, and they're not getting any vibes that you want them to shut up. I was walking from a venue once and alone and like looked behind me and there was somebody like walking pretty fast behind me. And I was like, what the f uh, Freaked out and I was walking to my hotel. And so I kind of like pick up the pace a little bit and walk faster and he starts running after me. And I was like, oh my God, I'm being chased. And then the guy is like, hey, I'd never chase you. I just want you to sign something. He was like actively chasing me <laughs> and was like, I would never chase you. <laughs> So <laughs> That is easy to laugh out now, but that is very scary, actually. It was scary for two seconds, and I looked back and I was like, oh no, like I missed this guy who wanted his record signed. But I feel like everybody, when they talk to somebody who they really admire, risks doing that. And I feel like I've definitely done that to people. The song Punisher on the record is about Elliot Smith. We would have lived 
less than a mile away from each other if he were alive right now. And now I know tons of his friends and have worked in studios that he's worked in. And he just would have been around in such a heavy way. And I know his whole dis discography. I've read every book about him ever. So the song is just kind of examining how it's impossible to have a normal relationship with someone that you grew up with as like an idol. What is Kyoto about? Motion sickness from the first record is almost ironically angry. I'm mad and I'm trying to get through it or something and it's a lot about resentment. Uh, and then I feel like Kyoto is kind of that sequel feeling where I'm mad at my dad, <laughs> but then kind of realizing that I'm also kind of over it. Forgiveness is a gift to yourself. And I totally feel like that. It sucks to walk around angry all the time. My dad and I started talking again for like the first time in a long time over COVID. So, wow. Wow. yeah, I, I, songs are great. They just kind of like help you work through <laughs> like kind of even before I feel it. Did he talk about the song at all to you? <laughs> he was like, <laughs> uh, not initially, but then like around Grammy, <laughs> he was like, hey, like that song that it's about me is nominated for a Grammy. <laughs> and that's the first time we talked about it. So I was like, oh. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm glad it was like lighthearted of a conversation for sure. When you were writing the song, were you genuinely working through those emotions in real time? What made you take that approach? Especially that refrain in the end. And even the idea of making the choruses different each time, they don't match one another. I think it was probably the fourth round where the choruses stopped matching. That's one of my favorite things about writing songs is I probably have five more choruses that sound pretty similar and could be in that song. My ability to dissociate is actually a great tool because I'm not super emotionally activated when I'm writing songs like that. And then like a year later I'm something or something, I'm like, that's up, that's a up song. How did you come up with that concept for the visual? I played Japan in early 2019 for the first time. It was like my favorite thing ever. I ended up writing Kyoto a little bit there. In early 2020, I was supposed to go back and play with the National. So I had this idea for this for the song where I was like, okay, we start with a green screen and then halfway through the video, I walk through something and then I'm in Japan. Just like perfect, beautiful, wide lens, it, but it's all real. And then we just, we shot the whole song on a green screen just in case. And then of course, you know, fast forward. So the video concept was just kind of accidental. I did not see that coming, that's crazy. The aesthetics with Stranger in the Alps, with the ghost on the cover, and then the skeleton that you perform in, that we see in Kyoto, that we see on the cover of Punisher. What are the meanings behind that, that dark aesthetic? I created a meaning for it after. Like, I found Angela Dean literally on Tumblr uh, I loved her art and sent her all these childhood photos of me and asked her to paint ghosts on them because that's what she does. And then as time went on, realizing how sad that is, you make a, an album a lot about your childhood and it's your first record and it's like you're painted over and when you take the ghost off, I'm smiling so big and it's like such a sad photo to me. And then the second record, I went out with my friend Olaf to the middle of the desert to take photos and I was wearing kind of like a beautiful dress and then got the photos back. Didn't think it was even gonna be an album cover. We had no idea. And then found that one photo and was like, I wish there was something funny about this. <laughs> like, why am I in like a beautiful gown? So I was a skeleton for Halloween with my band. So we did the photo shoot again with the skeleton costume. And I was like, it kind of makes sense because of the first record. It's like this silly $10 costume that represents death. And I feel like if I were to describe my music, it's kind of like that. It's like silly death. <laughs> so um, it's also really comfortable and really easy to play in. So I kind of made it easy for myself by having like the world's cheapest, easiest stage outfit. You made history this year. Uh, best rock performance for the first year in Grammy's history, all female artists or female led bands. What is it like being a part of that milestone? I mean, it's so rad, especially because I'm such a huge fan of 
every single nominee. I feel like that's my favorite part, is just like feeling like a part of something that I actually understand. I'm like, duh, like, duh, these people are nominated and it feels so cool to be in that group. I, I can only imagine. How do you think you'll look back at Punisher five years from now? I think I'll weirdly associate it more with 2020 than when I was writing it. People read into a lot of the lyrics to mean that the world was ending. And I'm, I'm kind of like, I always think the world is ending. It's not just about 2020, but it feels more like that now in retrospect. The fan interaction made it kind of more about when everybody heard it than what it was about, uh, wow. which I love. So I think I'll weirdly associate it with being very strangely alone all day, but then talking to more people than I ever have all at once. What did you learn about the industry at large? How was it shaped the way you navigate the music industry now? You are the boss. I think I didn't uh, internalize that for a real long time and I thought I had to like make people happy or I thought that people were doing me a favor. But I think I wish I could like go back and, and tell myself that people like you because they think they're gonna make money off of you and they think that you're cool. So your ideas are why everybody's here. So like stop pandering to the room and just do your own thing because it's cool.